Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Good evening. This is Pastor Spencer from Messiah Lutheran Church in Salem, Oregon. It is a Wednesday evening. It is the 22nd of December, the year of our Lord, 2021. It is not normally scheduled tonight to have anything. Normally we would have Advent services leading right up to Christmas, but being that Christmas is just a couple days away, Christmas Eve services, I thought we would go ahead tonight and just review what we learned during the Advent services, the theme being Ageless Questions of Advent. In the very first week, the question was, are you the one to come? The question was posed by John for his disciples to take back to Jesus. The disciples, of course, met John while he was in prison. They came to him, and I'm sure the whole world was turned upside down. Everything seemed to have been, have, having been going so well, except that all of a sudden, John's in prison, and he's in prison for telling the truth. He called Herod out. He said, you're living with, you're marrying your brother's wife. That is inappropriate. And he was thrown into prison and later beheaded for that. But the disciples had followed John, John's disciples that is, John the baptizer, had followed him. He was that great voice that broke the silence of the intertestamental period, that period of nearly 500 years when God had not sent a great prophet to Israel. John came back. He was the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. And he tells his disciples because they question what's going on, go ask Jesus, are you the one? Now, John himself, of course, I don't think, had any concern about knowing who Jesus was. After all, he pointed to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is also the one who said, There is one that stands among us who is greater than I am, whose sandal I am not worthy to unlash from his foot. And he's also the one that said, He must increase and I must decrease. John knew who Jesus was, but his disciples needed to learn who Jesus is, that John was simply preparing the way for him, and that he now needed to finish that. And he finished it by, of course, giving his own life. Jesus would do the same. Now, we should not be surprised that John's disciples were a little bit concerned and maybe conflicted and confused. Remember, these same disciples pointed to Jesus and his disciples saying, Master, they're over there doing what we're doing. Kind of like, this is our river. This is our spot. Why would they come here? <laughs> Not understanding. But we see that in the world all the time, don't we? I remember growing up and my grandfather loved the San Francisco Giants. That was his team. My parents liked the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they would talk about how great their team was and, of course, put down the other team. I never got caught up in that. I chose the Padres. I think it was something about the name. But people do that. They choose teams. My team's better than your team. And they will do things like that. In high school, I remember hearing people choosing sides over who was better, Jim Croce or Elton John, the bread or Moody Blues. You know, it was funny. People like to do that. They like to choose sides. They like to say, well, my team, my side. Our, our property. Get off. But John was working for God. John looked to Jesus as Lord. And, but that question is one that we need to ask too. Are you the one to come? Or shall we look for another? Of course, Jesus' response to John's disciples was, go back and tell them what you see. Jesus was healing the sick, making the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear the lame to leap, fulfilling what Isaiah the prophet said the Messiah would do. They needed to learn, and so do we, that he is the one. And that brings us to the second question, how can this be? That was the question from week number two. How can this be? The question really was posed by Zechariah as he was in making prayers, John the baptizer's father. The angel came to Zechariah and said, you will have a child. 
Zechariah was well advanced in years, as was his wife Elizabeth. How can this be? Or how will this be? So, maybe it was a question that he had because he knew that old men don't generally have kids and old women generally aren't fruitful. Maybe it was a concern that wasn't his wife but himself. Maybe he wasn't didn't consider himself capable of fathering. We just don't know. But we do know that due to his unbelief, due to his lack of agreement, that he had time to ponder. He had nine months to ponder, to read the word, to pray, to seek God's guidance. And the angel said, when the child's born, don't name him Zachariah, which would be normal, name him after yourself, but no, name him John. And of course, when people came to him when the child was born, they motioned, name him John, name him John. And they disagreed, but your name's not John. Is maybe that the father? But he knew better. And the moment the child's name was, he shall be named John, God freed his mouth, and he declared it himself and followed it with a litany of praise. Now he asked the question, how can this be in, in doubt? But Mary didn't. Mary asked it in expectation. So, what's next? How can this be? She was betrothed to, of course, Joseph. Betrothal then was the same as marriage. The only difference is they had not come together. They had not consummated. So maybe she was asking, am I supposed to consummate the marriage to have this child? But that wouldn't make her Virgin Mary, would it? And so the answer was, no, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. So she asked in faith, and then responded in faith. So let it be done to your servant. And then later we see that beautiful Magnificat as she visits Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, the child, John jumps in the womb, and Elizabeth's filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary, of course, said, My soul now magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. What a blessed time. And so God does what man cannot. Takes a woman that is well along in years and takes a girl that's never been with a man, and they both end up with a child from extraordinary means. And we all are blessed because of it. How can this be? Same thing's true for us when it comes to faith. We, in and of ourselves, can do nothing. We're not saved by our own works. It's the work of God. How can this be? Because with God, nothing is impossible. And this last week, the question was, for me? And that question was asked of the shepherds. The shepherds who were out biding in the fields at night, watching over the flock. The angels came to them and said, For unto you born this day in the city of David a Savior. Unto you. For me? Yes, for you, shepherds. The lowliest of all jobs, the dirtiest and grimiest and maybe loneliest, for you. Now, it's interesting when we think about these shepherds abiding in the fields. They weren't far from from where Jesus was born, which means they weren't far from Jerusalem. And it is said that the flock that they were tending that night happened to be the flock for all of the sacrificial lambs that went to the temple. But that night, their job was soon to end, for the real Lamb of God had come into the world. Come into the world to be sacrificed for our sin and our salvation. For me? Yes, for me. And for you. We, like those lowly shepherds, deserve nothing. But God in His grace and mercy have given us everything. And so all these questions are questions that we too should have. We too should be asking. We should ask, is He the one? And the answer should be a resounding yes. There is no other. The question should be asked, how can this be? It can be done by God, for nothing is impossible. And for me, 
because with God all things are possible. And he loved you that much that he sent his only begotten son so that none should perish, but that you might have eternal life. You see, that was the whole purpose of Christmas, to bring our replacement in, the person that would shoulder our sins, the person would live the life that we cannot, who would die a death that we dare not, to give us what we deserve, not eternal life. The moment Jesus was born, it was preordained that his life would end on the cross. And three days later, he would take it back up again because the wages of sin is death, and Jesus was sinless. The only sin he had was ours, and he dealt with it as the perfect sacrifice. The Lamb of God, the same Lamb of God that replaced all those lambs in the field, the same Lamb of God that became our Good Shepherd, the same Lamb of God who prepares for us a place in heaven, that where he is, we might be with him also. That's what we celebrate this Christmas. And we will ponder with Mary this Christmas Eve, as she pondered in her heart, so shall we ponder. And we will study as we see that God ponders, that all things might be well within our souls. That's all I have for you tonight. I pray that the Lord may bless you and keep you, may make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God's blessings. I want to invite you to Messiah Lutheran Church Friday evening at 7 p.m. for candlelight services, along with communion, that you might come into the very presence of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and know that He lives. God bless. Have a very peaceful night in the Lord.